Kia koto, no mai, haere mai, and welcome back to Showy Old Roos, a podcast where I, intrepid adventurer into inner space, Penny Ashton, fossick around under the fallopians and investigate around the ovaries as I attempt to dig up as much information as possible into just what the hell happens in menopause. A quick reminder, as always, that I am not a doctor. I did perform some surgery on my doll Miranda once to get the water out of her insides after I had given her a bath, but that involved using a hand-powered drill into her nether regions, which now that I stop and think about it is actually quite disturbing. So if you need information from someone who doesn't use a drill from the 1970s on a plastic perineum, then please do seek out a medical professional. Today's guest may not be a doctor, but she is at the forefront of leading the charge to transform our workplaces into menopause-friendly spaces. Kate Billing, 53, is the founder and creative director of the leadership development specialist company, Blacksmith. And when perimenopause came knocking with its anxiety and insomnia, she was caught completely unawares. Once Kate established the cause, she was pissed off to have never been taught about menopause and has become determined to make Gen X the last generation to be blindsided by it. She established the LinkedIn group Menopause Awareness and Action Community, which is growing every day and is an excellent resource and a very engaged group. Also, she is well on the way to her small goal of changing the world, which she describes as a team sport. Her raison d'etre is helping people to make the absolute most of their lives. She was a recent cover girl on the New Zealand Listener with their menopause feature, where she was sporting her present from her sister Amanda, a t-shirt that reads, Je suis trop, the French translating to, I am too much, to which I say, hashtag relate. Uh, But enough witterings from me. Please welcome someone who we can never have too much of, the always stylish, too, I have to add, with a very fabulous hairdo, very fabulous and entrepreneurial, Kate Billing. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. No worries. That's quite a lot to see. You've been doing a lot. Yeah, well, 53 years on the planet, you'd hope so. (laughs) Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. So now one thing I do have to ask, because I'm so, it's like I haven't had a day job for 20-something years. I'm so not in the corporate sort of realm and things like that. But what is human-centered leadership, which is what you are promoting through your company with Blacksmith? What does that mean? Yeah, it, it, it is about putting humans at the center of the leadership conversation, development, and practice, day-to-day practice of leadership. And people often say, oh, well, of course, isn't that the way it always is? And uh, no, is my experience. <laughs> yeah, because it's about um, money as opposed to people. Yeah, and this is, you know, I was one of the founders of the Conscious Capitalism Movement in New Zealand. Blacksmith is a certified B Corp uh, for Benefit Corporation. And so this comes for us from a place of, comes from multiple start points, I guess, one of them being that the sole intention of business isn't just to make money, that actually business is a principal contributor to societal health and well-being, to the way the planet is, to, you know, all of these things. And actually the development we get at work can and should help us be better people, not just better cogs in the wheel. And so there's the overall, what is the point of business that we kind of look at a bit differently and then saying, well, the part of human beings in business and recognizing that organizations are human systems, not constructs and pyramids and what, you know, the even the old uh, telegraph wire model of an org structure, which lots of people will be familiar with is very industrial, like the industrial age and the emergence of modern workplaces from that, is saying we've actually forgotten and never learned on top of that a whole lot about what it is to be human individually and how to be great humans together, particularly in a world that's increasingly by our own hands, not designed for us to show up and be well, have great leadership capacity. There are lots of triggers for conflict, misunderstanding, overwork. We're kind of living and working contrary to the way human beings are designed. And so the the human-centered approach is saying, understand what it is to be human yourself as a leader, because you're the human at the center of leadership. And then understand how human beings play together for good or otherwise and how we might do a better job of that within a business context so that everyone is healthy, well, we do good by the planet and by society. Yeah, which, you know, it's like, 
it feels like it's not rocket science, even though I'm not sure rocket science falls into those, those definitions. <laughs> but it yeah. feels like such a, a clear and obvious thing. But yeah, so often people don't put the well-being of their workers at the forefront. And you just see so much burnout, so much antipathy, therefore, and therefore high turnover of staff and, and stuff, I'm sure, as well. Yeah. So yeah, have you have you managed to change people's minds completely to the way that they approach their business? It's an emerging space. And what I'm really pleased to see in some ways, you know, the shitstorm that has been the world of the past couple of years, um, that has thrown into people's faces the importance of understanding things like, you know, even it's great we can use technology and tools to remote work, et cetera, but what does that do to one of our basic human security needs of connection and belonging? Yeah, you know, yep. so we just because we can do things and we've got technology to do it doesn't mean it's necessarily taking us in a positive direction. So this whole awareness of actually how humans work individually and collectively, most people don't know anything about it. And it, there are, you know, contextual changes that are happening in the world around ways of working, technology, broader health concerns beyond just burnout and a lot of the ways that it's being approached in terms of resolving it is a bit a bit lick and stick. Right. But okay. like let's just pop a band-aid on it and hold it together. Right. Right. Rather than going, actually, we fundamentally need to press pause, look at the way human beings are wired and understand how we might chart a new path forward using technology, say, and remote ways of working in a way that is works with human beings rather than just seems like a good idea because we've got the tech. Yeah, and and so a friend of mine brought this up on her podcast in the UK, saying that, and you know, and technology is invented to save time, but yet so often it ends up like you know, phones, for example. Yeah, phones are such a fundamental. Like I use my phone all the time for work, but I just use my phone all the time, and like, and I'm constantly yeah. saying, "Put your phone down." But and then of course during my screen time, we're crazy, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, and it's still pretty shitty. And and it's because my husband's got a job now where he's away for long because he had a big, you know, the great resignation. Yeah. He really because he was a draftsman in an engineering firm and he just never loved it. And now he's working in a bike shop. And so he's way happier, but it means he's not as home as much. So then I'm by myself a lot more. And I quite I hadn't realized quite how much that was getting to me until I went to Christchurch a couple of weeks ago. And I spent basically 12 hours chatting um, with family and friends and stuff and realized how much I had missed that and yeah. being out of the house to connect with people and showing off because that's what I do. I'm a performer. So getting back on stage finally, like I did my first gig. When was that? I don't know, last year, kind of late last year before it all got cancelled again and cried afterwards because <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, people. I, know, I think this is, this is the understanding of how we're wired and the need for, like this is a facsimile of in-person connection and there's a whole lot that we can do about making audio and video connection more meaningful mm -hmm. in terms of how we do it and, and facilitate it and design for it as well as using, you know, this is synchronous and asynchronous stuff. So we're in the moment together, but mm -hmm. people will be listening to us later. But then we have to be think this is not all it can be. We have to have in-person as well. And how we mm. do in-person connection, whether it's with our friends and family, important communities of which we are a part, or our workplaces. And when I say workplaces, that means any of the relationships that you have that mean you create value in the way that's special for you and for you that's with an, a live audience mm -hmm. that's that's in a really important part of the mix part important part of the mix and so I guess if we kind of pull back on all of this and say well so why menopause it's I, I think from my perspective when I the things that are important for me in my work increasingly are around leadership well-being personal growth and leadership capacity so our capacity to lead in any set of circumstances mm -hmm. as human beings for women in the workplace you know roughly between the ages of 45 and 55 and we know that lots of women younger than this experience and when I say women I mean anyone who has the female biological bits mm -hmm. listeners so if you're a trans man or you're non-binary with biological female wiring this includes you we are the fastest growing portion of the world, global workforce we are now the most experienced demographic largest most experienced demographic in the workforce of people of our age in any previous generation 
there are also more of us in leadership and business ownership roles and independent roles like yours, my sister's an artist and actor as well, who are actually, we're just, we're recognizing that aging might not be what we were told it was, although midlife comes with a whole lot of complexities in terms of identity and stereotypes and then, of course, navigating this peculiar little thing that is menopause that no one has told us about. Yep. But along with that, we recognise actually we're at the beginning of a whole new exciting path and potentially at the height of our powers, or maybe not even. That may be right. over our 50s and 60s, the best is yet to come, when most of us hadn't even thought about it. Yep. You know, and so in menopause is this experience that is common to so many people you know it's not I hear men sometimes likening it to prostate cancer and it's like no it's not cancer no no (laughs) no no prostate cancer really important that men take care of their health etc but it's also not like comparing it to cervical cancer yeah it's an imperative basically it's what we all go through through and it is this aspect of well-being it impacts on our engagement our performance our joy, et cetera. And because people don't know enough about it, you go into this thing and think, oh, fuck, it's going to last forever because yeah. that's the way the human brain works. Like mm. when it's good, you don't think about the bad stuff. When it's bad, you can't imagine it's ever going to be good again. Yeah. And this is why things like your show and all the work that lots of people are doing around raising awareness is so important so people have a construct, fact-based construct that they can put their experience in, not jump out of the workforce. Yes, yes, yes. Because they think they're losing their minds or they think it's going to last forever and recognize it's just a little something to navigate. And that on the other side of it is actually freedom, independence, giving less fucks (laughs) and like the best years of your life. Yeah, right. Which I found hard. I couldn't believe a few years ago, but now I can. Oh, wow. Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you the first question that I ask everybody, and that is, what has your relationship been like with your body through your life, and what journey has it been on? (laughs) So how long have we got? Yeah, I know. (laughs) I feel like I could just do a podcast. It's just that question because it is enormous, and it's so crazy, isn't it? It's just this bag of bones that we get around in every day, and it's just loaded with so much. So, yes, tell us about yours. It's um, – I do a lot of, so some of the work that I do with people is around, principally around their relationship with themselves, Mm. right? That's where leadership starts, our ability to lead ourselves. Um, How can we show up powerfully and profoundly for others if we can't be with ourselves in a way that is equally loving, encouraging, challenging, and supportive? And one of the stories that I share as part of that work is what I call my bumblebee story. And that's when I was six years old. In ballet class. Oh, even, snap, I did that. I, I got a bee sting in ballet class, but anyway, yes, keep going. So, and one of the things, you know, after you teach six year olds basic foot positions, arm positions, and how to do a demi plie, it's like, what do you do with them? Mm-hmm. Dress them up uh, as bumblebees. So, well, we were just asked to be, we were actually asked to be butterflies. Oh. So, dance around the studio, you know, and a bit of improvisational dance and be like butterflies. And after a while of doing that and floating around and fluttering, you know, the teacher drew us back together in the center of the room, you know, with the beautiful wooden floorboards and big glass windows and white walls and mirrors. I'm just imagining mine straight away in Christchurch in the Peterborough Center. Yeah, and everyone's in their little black leotards with the pink waistband and you know your hair scraped back in a very severe style and she said you know she called my name and I was like oh oh," you know instantly going oh I've been a great butterfly but no she said to me that I made a better bumblebee than a butterfly and so I mean I didn't deconstruct the story until sometimes sometime later when I was in group therapy for a long running and particularly nasty eating disorder Oh, right. And this was the beginning of me starting to form beliefs that I wasn't graceful, I wasn't feminine. Mm. And that became then reinforced by the fact that I love and have been good at things like hockey and sprinting. And I got into weightlifting, um, <laughs> doing weights in my when I was like 16, 17, because it helped my sprint speed. And... And your bones. A, yep, in my bones. And had a, my a boyfriend at 17 who told me I had legs like a man. As a bad thing. Yeah, because yeah. they were bigger than his. 
In fact, when I met my husband, I was bigger than him because I was going through a bodybuilding phase. So, you know, he was not a small guy and I was bigger than him. So Mm. my relationship with my body and my identity of my body, I I think, has has been a less than easy one for Mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. And strangely, now that it is softer and a bit more spongy and... (laughs) different shapes yeah. than it used to be I almost I feel better about it than I have at any stage of my life like I look back I had to we've just recently moved house and had to go through my wardrobe and stuff and decide what was going out you're yeah. a, pair of, just a pair of jeans I couldn't get them past my knees right and I just thought I felt sad for the version of me that had done what she needed to do to be big enough to be tiny enough yeah to get into those clothes. And so I think it's a, I think women's relationships with their bodies are complicated for a variety of reasons and in the ways that identity is complicated. Mm -hmm. But I have to say now I don't look at my body as a thing. It's part of who I am. You mean like as as you sort of externalize looking at it and judging it? but now you just inhabit it. I, I think it, it's it's a big shift and something that I encourage all humans to make because I, men have their own yep. stuff to deal with. We, we do not have the market covered on neuroses. Yep. And it is instead of having a body, it's about being in your body and seeing it as, an, as part of the whole and integrated and authentic self that you have. And, and I'm grateful to my body. I talk to her a lot great and appreciate her rather than be hypercritical and hateful but Mm -hmm. it has been a long journey yeah and it's so crazy to me too that these ballet teachers have such power (laughs) over how we feel about ourselves because my ballet teacher would say she I always remember this you have such wonderful expression if only I could give you a different body like she oh just, my God. I know that's not even like you're a better bumblebee. That's just like straight out, oh dear. Like she, and also I just really, and not to say that that's not diminishing what was said to you, but you know, she she wouldn't even thought about that past two days, and here we are talking about it. You know, forty seven years later, that she just made that flippant comment, and it's got so stuck in you. And these women have such power, and I just think they abused it for so long, or they just didn't think about what their words created. Well, no, and I, and you can't go through life in lots of ways being too. Uh, we'd spend our lives working, walking on eggshells, and still crush them. Yeah, like it's uh, the best that you can hope for. Hope for with this is that you become a person aware enough, and courageous enough, and willing enough to do the work to unpick it all, mm. and become a better person because of it. As opposed to in spite of it. Exactly. And right. not be a victim to it. Not yeah. be a victim to it. And I think this is part of the menopause thing, right? It's easy to be a victim mm-hmm. of our bodies and to rail your fist at the universe about here's another way in which women are dealt yeah. <laughs> a, bloody, a bloody dud hand. Yeah. But what I think it actually is, is it is a very clear transitional moment in life where we get to be with our bodies in a new and different way and be with ourselves and actually each other. Increasingly, you know, this as a conversation that creates a different way of women to be connected to each other in a way that's not surface. We have to get real with each other about our experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what the other thing she did when I was in ballet, she just stopped saying anything to me, like oh, stopped gosh. correcting me, stopped. I was basically invisible. She'd take my money. But I, because I was never going to be a ballerina, but you know, and here I am making a reasonably good living full time dancing, singing, et cetera, you know, but she was, I was written off in her eyes because of my massive tits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you, neither you nor I have the frames. Yeah. The frames for it. You've got to be teeny tiny with like bird like bones. And now it's so not my thing. I'm much more going to be the, um, the rude. <laughs> And you were talking about balls on stage. Oh, how I adore big balls and things like that from my Jane Austen show. Yeah. So it's slightly different that way. No, they're so they're so strong and disciplined and graceful. Yes. And you know, there but there is a very what it takes is apart from all of the commitment and the work, is a physical predisposition. Absolutely. That you cannot 
bend yourself into. No, if you don't have it, you don't have it. It's like being an Olympic sprinter. If you're going to win a gold Olympic medal in the 100 metres as a woman, you have to not only work very hard for it, it helps if you're born with specific genetic makeup. It's exactly right. (laughs) So how did you find yourself moving past your eating disorder, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, Painfully. Right. It um, started as one thing and morphed into another and and uh, you know these things are always complex and it was very much so it was bulimia bulimia nervosa that okay. started out as compulsive eating yeah. and actually is in part born out of that same experience because the parts of the brain that are associated with shame and guilt are wired into the reward circuitry of the brain in a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. And so there is this, this is part of the addiction cycle that happens for people where the reward is often a behavior that drives the shame response, that drives a reward response. And it's this really nasty kind of partnership. And so there's a lot of unwiring that one has to do around shame principally. And, And especially when the behaviors whether it's drugs, sex, overeating, and of course, binging and purging is a pretty, it's a premeditated, controlled and uncontrolled. It's this combination of control and absolute lack of control. And there's a lot of work over a lot of years that have to be done Mm. to find your way back, to find one's way back to where does this begin and how do you change the narrative, your yeah. internal narrative, around those experiences? And the fact that actually you don't know, like actually knowing that shame, guilt, and reward are wired together in the brain, weird bit of design, thank yeah. God, or whoever yeah. was responsible. Goddess, yes. Goddess, <laughs> she who must be obeyed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, weird bit of wiring, didn't know that as a six-year-old, got set up that and over the ensuing kind of 10 years, set up a belief system that was actually about something that was just wired in as a hardwire issue. It set up a software issue in the belief system. So you mm. have to go back and debug the software, basically, debug (laughs) debug the program. And so it's a massive personal growth and self-exploration exercise. And, you know, it's something that casts a long shadow. Mm -hmm. But what it did, it played into doing the work to get through it, played into the stuff that I love, which is about neurobiology and physiology and psychology and all the rest of it, all of the stuff I, you know, had studied and was passionate about having to apply it to myself and my own life as a live fire experiment and piece of work. And that's actually, I think, getting through that in in my late 20s is what set me off on this path of which is winding up where I am now around human-centered, taking a human-centered approach to life, leadership and work, is applying the same things and saying, well, actually... The way we're wired isn't all things just because something's wired that way or it's natural doesn't mean it's right or that we have to accept it. You know, we can we can work with what's there if we know more. Yeah, and you're the living embodiment, therefore, of you are how you are because of that as opposed to in spite of that. A hundred percent. Yeah, and then leading that to help other people who have been through various things of them themselves. Yeah. I mean, I I developed a stress-related autoimmune disorder through that same period as well. So there was a whole lot of stuff. My 20s were a crucible Mm. Mm. (laughs) that I'm not sorry happened, but I wouldn't repeat. Yes. You know, I am who I am because of that time and all of the ways. And is that where blacksmith comes from? Like, Black, yeah, blacksmith. Because when you think about it, I was going to say that. It's like you're in that blacksmith fire being shaped. You're in the forge. Yeah. It's... It, the thing about this, the blacksmith idea is, is uh, has many layers, but that's definitely one of them. It is about the art and science of it. So mm-hmm. it's very much an in-the-moment exercise. You have to understand metallurgy and how metal works and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. And you have to know how to use the tools, mm-hmm. like the bigger the anvil, the better, things like that. But also you have to work with what's in the moment because – Air temperature plays into how metal responds, how hot the fire is, all the rest of it. It's a creative act 
And I look at it as, you know, it's about making things that are beautiful and useful for form and function. But you have to be prepared to sweat it out and do some work and get a bit dirty. Right. <laughs> and billing, the, um, my surname, comes from the word biller, which means people of the sword. So it's both we made swords and we knew how to use them. So I'm, uh, I come from a long line of warriors and <laughs> <laughs> sword, sword swingers, sword makers and swingers. And I love that too. It's so often we look at a brand and go, okay, but then you hear all of that behind it. And it's just, you've thought about that so much and it seems therefore so perfect. But now, did you know that you work? Did you know anything about menopause? I I assume not. So what, what, where did that, how did that start? Like you just had, did your mum talk about it? How was her menopause? No, she didn't, she didn't talk about, I was very aware of a particular period of her experience where I remember her body changed quite significantly in quite a short period of time, her body okay. shape. She had been one of those people who was always looked young, younger than she was always because she was just super active all over the place, biked everywhere. As a family, we were super active. She wore beautiful clothes, most of which she made herself. And then there was a period where her, her body definitely changed into, you know, that middle-aged body stereotype of getting thicker around the middle. And I also remember discerning in her, experiencing in her that she was not as upbeat. I wouldn't say depressed because we didn't talk about it, so I can't put that label on it, but that she was definitely quieter, more somber, didn't have the joy and the smiles and the energy. Now, for a considerable portion of this, I wasn't in New Zealand. So I had would sort of notice these things when I came back home for visits Mm. and that kind of thing. And we only it only was directly mentioned once in conversation, and that would be when she might have been my age or a little bit younger, to do with changing contraception needs that she would need to discuss with my father. Right. Let's leave it there because I, right, okay. you know, don't want to give don't want to give family secrets away. Right. Okay. But that was that was it. We didn't talk about it, but then we didn't really talk about the other end either. We didn't really talk like there wasn't the big puberty conversation. How did you find out about it? Oh no, there was a little bit of a chat, like you might right. expect this to be happening and everything else. And so let me know. Okay, good. I will. Right. And then it was just done. Right. I mean, okay. it was, this, it was, you know, it was like, what was it then? The early, early eighties in provincial New Zealand. Right. Where was this? Ma- in Masterton in the Wairarapa. Masterton. Right. Okay. Excellent. So I'm sorry, is, is your mum still with you? Yes. yes oh, right. Excellent. Much, yeah. so, so what have you talked about now that this has happened to you? And you've been like, what the fuck mum? What's happening? <laughs> Again, not much. Cause it's like, well, I said to her, so we didn't really talk about it. And she sort of was like, well, it's the sort of thing that matters to you when you're in it. It's right. A, and, and not much when you throw it or didn't really think about it. Because when she was going through it, I was in my like, late 20s, mm. early 30s, and I was more concerned with infertility <laughs> than I right. was with menopause. And right. she figured talking about the end of that window might not be a good idea. Oh, okay. So you had a, a hard journey with that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes, and I can see that that she might have thought that that was insensitive. That's like that's that was the that was the focus was can we get pregnant, stay pregnant, have a healthy baby. So talking right, like why would you? And then by the time you kind of get older, don't you don't think about it. And right. also, I just think it wasn't something that was talked about. Right. Yeah. yeah well, absolutely, absolutely. That time. And do you mind if I ask? Sorry, did you have children? No. I mean, with your body's journey, that's enormous. As well. I mean, I've, I've felt very lucky in my life that I haven't wanted children. So that is, yeah. So that's hard to come to terms with. And I guess menopause is an extra, like, ugh, knowing that that is. No, I, like I say, it was about like the eating disorder stuff. It's all part of the getting to the place of going, okay, well, it's not happening. <laughs> they can't tell us why it's not happening. Oh, it right. should be happening. Let's press pause and think about if this is what we really want. Because I think there's a whole lot of stuff in life that we do on autopilot or because of social norms and expectations or dreams we had when we were young that by the time we're the age, the dream could be made real. We're not actually interrogating whether it's what we want anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think it was partly, you know, I had lots of friends. I think the most difficult part of it all, to be honest, was having friends have get pregnant and have children and everything and not being in it. That was the hardest bit was... And then when we pressed pause and said, let's just take two years to work out whether this is what we really want before we commit to, you know, the next level of 
going yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is massive. Yeah. Which is massive. And we just, we got to a place of going, no, actually, we don't want to do that. Yeah. And so I you think- can't make peace with it and just go, right. okay, that's not what's, that's not the path that's meant for us in this life. So what does that open up the capacity for? Was that immensely liberating? Yes. Yeah. Was there a grieving process with that? Or was 100%. That just, 100%. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 And obviously not in anywhere near the same, but that's what I think about with the ballerina thing, you know, it's what I'd always wanted to be and was so focused on that. And then, but then did I? Yeah. No, no, that seems trivial by comparison, but yeah, it's well, the I same remember, sort of thing. I, I spoke to my nana about it, my dad's mum, and she had had five boys and she said to me, look, she said, darling, whether you do or you don't, you will always look at the other path and wonder. Mm, very wise. I know, she was a super wise woman. I mean, she got into reading Krishnamurti in her, like, 80s and okay. stuff like that. So right. she she finished school at the end of Form 2 and had a job as a seamstress apprentice at 13. And So right. she was a, um, a, wise, a wise woman. Right, okay. Right. Mm. Okay, there is a lot going on here. So then how did uh, menopause start manifesting itself in you? Um, I think it was 45 when I had a, a night sweat, like yeah. the full-on wake up in the middle of the night and it's like you've been in the shower in your clothes. And that's quite early, I would say. Or is it? You know more than I do. This no, day. and look, honestly, of things like that, no, it's not actually that early. Right, okay. So this is another thing that people, I partly, I didn't look for what it was because I thought menopause was something that happened to people in their like 60s. It happened right. to old people. <laughs> um, yep. And so it wasn't like I, I was like, God, this is really weird. What's this? Did a bit yeah. of research. Went, oh, maybe it's that, but it can't be because I'm only 45. Because I'm so young. I'm so young. And look, it happens for people a lot earlier than that. You can have early onset menopause. You can have surgical menopause. Yeah. You can have yeah. all sorts of things it can happen for people as early as their 20s or 30s. Mm. Most people start perimenopause is kind of a period of five to 10 years in the lead up to menopause. Menopause is just 12 months without a period. I'm sure listeners will have heard all of that before. Yes, indeed. So, and if the average age in New Zealand for completing menopause is 52, the same age as the average age for making CEO, hmm. that if you've got five to 10 years before that, then you can expect it to be hmm. starting sort of 40 to 45. Yeah, right. Um, now, at 53, uh, my doctor tells me, based on my cycles and all the rest of it, I'm still in early perimenopause, which uh-huh. is slightly frightening. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm on a, I've been on HRT for six months now, so it's not that frightening anymore. All oh, right. So, like, well, okay. So you had a. Ho- I mean, was that quite scary with you having like a drenching? Yeah, it was just kind of what the fuck is what the this? Fuck is this? <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> um, and then, but I've only like of night sweats like that, that extreme. I've only had like three. Oh wow. And that was the first instance, right? Okay. That was the first instance. So I, I had got out of the habit since the fertility stuff. I'd got out of the habit of tracking my cycle because it's like, yeah. don't really care anymore. Yeah, I've never, I've never done that. So yeah, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but started tracking it again. Uh huh. And so you know, just using, encourage people use an app on your phone, and because it is really helpful. In fact, there's some recent research that's come through about the connection between the length of women's cycles and the severity of their menopause yes, symptomatic yes. experience. And and the, I had, is it the shorter? Shorter, the-, the worse it is, yeah. And I've had quite, I mean, I've had like, I don't know, what I always thought were not kind of normal length cycles of 24 to 26, 27 days. Some right. people have longer cycles. Average obviously is 28. Um, if it's less than 25 days, consistent if you have major proportion of them are less than 25 days then that's a shorter cycle and you can expect potentially to have more significant symptoms whether that means multiple symptoms or severity right so I had that night sweat started tracking things things I wasn't aware of that actually when I look back make sense things like developing arthritis in my feet right and like significant joint pain Mm mm-hmm Insomnia, my sleep started getting majorly disrupted, developed particularly in the last few years quite significant anxiety. And I think, and I'd had depression before, but not anxiety. Right. 
Okay. And it's she's an entirely different ball of wax. That right. Puppy. Okay. Right. And I, I think also for a lot of women, and if they've been in this stage of life in the past couple of years during COVID, dependent on how COVID's impacted their lives, for me as a business owner, it was, you know, in the business of gathering people together mm. in person. And talking to them. Yeah, and right. talking to them. And much, doing, much like mine. Much like yeah, mine. And doing deep development work, a lot of which doesn't easily translate online through the mm. two-hour earlier conversation. Yeah. I was like, what of it is perimenopause and what of it is just dealing with yep. this crazy, chaotic, you know, never in our, never in living memory yep. and pa- pandemic. You know, we were, we had a resilient business based on economic conditions, but not based on everyone being locked in their homes. Yeah. So I, I wasn't quite kind of sure, but I had increased tinnitus in terms of ringing in my ears, oral migraines, which were a, uh, just crazy the first couple of times they happened. And had you had any migraines before? I'd had migraine migraines, like the migraines that make you want to vomit and you have to lie in a dark room. In Mm. fact, when I was at university, I had to be, there was about a six month period where I was on medication, little blue pills four times a day to deal with the severity of migraines. Wow. But oral migraines are different. They don't come as a headache they come as a visual disturbance because it is the optic nerves fritzing, so you get this zigzaggy yeah, stuff I, across your eye. I could only read half a word when I was yeah. 10. My mum thought I was having a stroke or something, and I was like, what is this? And then I got a bad headache. But, yeah, and, that is, and when I started my epileptic pills, that they all stopped, which was interesting. Which is, yeah, the brain. Was, yeah, the so, brain indeed. So, yeah, I think there were a whole lot of sim- – some of the symptoms that are obvious, like the vasomotor skills, both vasomotor symptoms of, hot, you know, hot flushes, night sweats, et cetera, those are the things that people know about and they tend to be the first symptoms people experience. But then there are a whole lot of other things like perennial hay fever. Right. That, yeah, I haven't heard of that one, actually. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because there are estrogen receptors in over like 300 – places in the body but it's not just estrogen like one of the things that's made the biggest difference to me is actually the progesterone yeah yeah is that 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 seems to be the one that modifies the anxiety more correct yeah yeah so in terms of you know the emotionality of PMS what people think of as PMS symptoms a lot of which is to do with mood and sleeplessness and yes you can have feelings like a heavy heaviness in your abdomen and stuff Mm. some of that's estrogen but more of the the emotional uh, mindset stuff is to do with the progesterone cliff that happens in that last seven days of your cycle. Right, right. And so when you're hurtling through the roller coaster that is perimenopause, it's something that's not talked about a lot, actually, into, is the progesterone impact. Most people just think it's estrogen, but it's yeah. made an enormous difference to me. Having... So are you taking utrogestin? Yes, micronized micronized bioidentical progesterone and then estradiol, the estradiol transdermal patches, 50. So because it's early for me, 50 is hopefully going to be enough to level things through. I shouldn't need to go up from there, which is great. Right, okay. So then how did you put it all together? It was 2020 and I was in this. Such timing, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And... There was a whole lot of stuff going on because I had turned 50 the year before and recognized there was a lot going on internally around internalized ageism and Mm -hmm. bumping up against these kind of middle-aged woman stereotypes and aging and my body was changing and there was a whole lot of stuff that was happening and I can't remember what it was, I, but I just, in particular because the anxiety was going through the roof, sleeplessness going through, couldn't think straight, was starting to do things like put my car keys in the fridge. Wow. You know, right. It's like, yep. It's <laughs> odd. Start thinking about early onset dementia, obviously, <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that. So just started reading and doing some research because that's always my first thing is like, okay, go research. Yeah. I need context. I need to understand more. It could be this or it could be other things. Yeah. And so that kind of led me into this pathway. And then by kind of late 2020, I had started talking to a few clients about it and just saying, you guys talking about this? You guys thinking about this in terms of the impact on um, – this like super important group of women in your organization yeah and they were like oh no I hadn't really thought about it I said what about your own experience because most of them were women mm, yeah, hadn't really thought about it and just started I think noticing a bit more talking about it a bit more sharing a little bit more in places like LinkedIn mm. and it was 
during 2021 that I just got really pissed off. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, and I still, HRT was uh, was still something I hadn't considered because I too had been, you know, yep. brainwashed by all of the bullshit coverage out of the WHI study. study. Yep. Which has been described. So this is a wonderful, if people are looking for a little something to educate themselves, Dr. Peter Attia, who is, I'm a mad fan of him and Dr. Andrew Huberman. And Huberman is a, um, he's a neurobiologist and associate professor at Stanford who looks at the brain and he's brilliant. And Attia is a Stanford trained physician who's one of the world's leading experts on increasing lifespan, health span, and athletic performance. And so they did in August, I think, a um, podcast interview, part of which is about 25 minutes of it, is about hormones and women, in women, estrogen and progesterone supplementation. And Atia describes it as, quote, hands down... <laughs> I wrote right. it down. Hands down, the biggest screw up in the medical profession in the last 25 years. Yeah. And the disservice that has been done to women. Yep. Two generations of that, of women, right? Pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. And so I was like, oh, I'm not bad enough because it's so high risk. I'm not bad enough. HRT won't help. I don't want to take it because it's so high risk. You know, breast yep. cancer, oh, the boogeyman. Yep. And it's like, well, actually drinking alcohol, which I enjoy, is way more yeah. dangerous. In yeah. fact, if you look at the study in detail, taking bioidentical micronized progesterone actually reduces your risk of breast cancer. Right, yeah. So that kind of 2021, I just, I got pissed off and I thought the, the big thing is I didn't know and so I catastrophized or made up stories or didn't join the dots and I wonder about my own ex symptomatic experience and therefore how much of the turbulence could be taken out of women's experience of this time of life if we knew more going in yeah, and we got access to the right support through it. Maybe because I, I firmly believe that doesn't, it's, it's a really important stage for some people. It's very problematic. One in five women have a really challenging time with it. The majority of us have a somewhat difficult and at times challenging time of it. And one in five women are like, what period? Oh yeah. And, you know, I spoke to a woman late last year, maybe out a year ago. And she was like, oh, yeah, now you mentioned I haven't had a period for four years, I don't think. And I was like, what? how do you not <laughs> – how is that wow. a now that you mention it conversation? Yeah. Right. So I've I had quite a few women that I've interviewed because I've wanted to have the full gamut, you know, and who, who barely noticed anything. Yeah, so – but the funny thing is when you know a lot and you're coming up to it, then you can catastrophize about what might – and, you know, and I'm seeing menopause in clouds sometimes now, like going, oh, that must be menopause. But, I'd, yeah, so I'm like on the precipice with a lot of – and I'd much rather be in possession of all this information than completely ignorant of it. But it can sort of become a bit consuming about what might happen as well. Well, I think this is part of the the opportunity and challenge is to demystify a whole lot of it yep. and to just make it clear what's actually going on, that it is natural, mm. it is temporary, yep. and mm. that with the right support, understanding life, some lifestyle changes so that you do things like prioritize sleep, moderate alcohol, move a little bit more. Your body's ability to process sugar goes through the floor, so drop some of that. You know, there are a whole lot of lifestyle things you can do. It might be a little bit of flexibility that you need at work sometimes if insomnia, say, is a thing or fl hot flushes are a thing. But it's not forever. And I think that part of, I guess what I'm what mindful of with the conversation in the media and in organizations etc is that we don't blow it up to this big catastrophic yeah you fucked for years <laughs> yeah. kind of thing where hopefully we can ease my uh, my goal for myself and what I would love to see other women have as part of their intention is to ease the glide plane yeah yeah that's it so that it's not so yeah, crazy up and down, but that we ease the guide pain and that we recognize that our symptomatic experience will change through time as our hormone profiles change. But I know Nikki Bazant found this in her research for her book, This Changes Everything, that one of the big upsides on the other side of all of this is the freedom of never having a period again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I talked to Jane Caro, who's Australian feminist, and she was like, oh, my God, not having a period, wearing, being able to wear white pants, um, which I don't think I will ever adopt. But anyway, but, yeah, she just loves that, et cetera. And that's one thing too. Uh, like I'm actually doing a live showy ovaries for the Nelson 
Festival of the Arts with yes. Nikki and Nikki. With the, um, with the Nikkis. With the two Nikkis. And and one thing, I think it was Nikki Pellegrino or either of them, but they said that they really want to try and focus on all the positives as well, which, you know, I think it's is something that hasn't important. happened as much. Yeah. So absolutely yeah. just talk about what is good about it, et cetera. So now what, uh, even though it's funny when you said that, it made me think of e-bikes. So e-bikes, you know, <laughs> like they just smooth out the hills, right? Yeah. So we so we want to try apply the e-bike technology to menopause and make it smooth. Yeah, just smooth it out. It's not avoid it. It's about just smoothing it out a little bit. Yeah, smoothing out those hills. Now, what yeah. do you say about there's some pushback? Because I, now you have a friend, I think, I can't remember her name. Is it Jeanette? Keo Perkinson. Yes. yes. So she's sort of, is she working with you or? No, she, Jeanette, well, Jeanette has a very big job in that she is the global chief people officer for PhD Creative. And she started Power Pause, which yes. is a um, not for profit. That's about providing resources and education. So she's trying to keep, you know, doing power pause and amongst her very busy right. day job with a global team. So she yeah. doesn't, I don't know that she sleeps very much. Yes. Well, because I heard her being interviewed on <laughs> National Radio and Kim Hill was bizarre to my mind listening to that. Well, I think she- Kim, Kim was Kim. Was Kim. Yes. Kim was Kim and she was of that opinion, it seemed, that we don't want to talk about it or bring it to male attention within the workplace because it will give another reason not to employ women of a certain age, which I can see to some point of view. But then what do you say to that? I mean, obviously, I think it's sort of nonsense. Look, I think it's part of the fear that's associated with it that comes through for midlife, the reality of being a midlife woman in the current, in the world as it is, about ageism and sexism combined yeah. When you get into, I mean, women start experiencing ageism in the workplace uh, from the age, about the age of 40. Yeah. Uh, and certainly once you're in your 50s, it's a thing. And so I think menopause is associated with that because it's an age related female experience. So yep. they're, they're kind of tied up together. Interestingly, talking with other people, like there are a group of us, different disciplines, whether that's doctors or people like the Nikki's or Jeanette, me, Sarah Connor from Menopause Over Martinis, you know, the few other people in, involved in this group, which we call the Pause Posse. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're all about making change in our own ways. Yeah. And one of the ways in which we want to do it, and Anne Wilson, who's a um, partner at Anthony Harper and Christchurch Employment Law Partner, and I are talking with a member of parliament at the moment about hopefully, fingers crossed, getting a private member's bill put forward into the box, into the cake tin, to have the Human Rights Act of 1993 amended to specifically include menopause and menstruation under the sex protected characteristic so that there is less likelihood of overt or covert discrimination on that basis. Yeah. Because I think it is a thing and I appreciate people's concerns about it and I see often post-menopausal women in senior leadership roles being the ones who put up the most resistance and I would um, venture that Kim is a post-menopausal woman. Potentially, Um, yes. Yeah, potentially. Mm -hmm. Where often they're like, just don't talk about it. Yeah. Don't make a big thing about it. Yeah. Whereas I think our generation, Gen X, are saying, no, fuck it. Yeah. We why didn't we know? Why are why? we not supported? Yeah. It's not a big thing. We don't want it to be a big thing, but it's an important thing and we want people to understand it and be supported through it so that they can stay happy, healthy, and high performing, high contributing members of the workforce in their lives. Yeah. And it's just this whole notion that bodies are gross and disgusting and ooh, I don't want to talk about it. I've been told not to talk about my tits so much and comedy and things like that, as if the thing that nourishes the whole world is gross. So to me, it seems to be all linked into that body shaming and you know like why can't we just talk about blood and stuff like that but people get so upset by it so yes and then what what, and I actually gave a a speech in parliament which was hilarious I zoomed into a speech um that Ingrid Leary asked me to do with Lewis Wall. so yes so it's great that parliament is starting to think about this more and hopefully things will come from that and obviously because I talked to Carolyn Harris um from Wales which was she's very delightful and very feisty lady and obviously the UK is doing fabulous things around all of this too there has yeah. been some backlash as well with some some columns and things like that but they seem to be a lot of the time written by women that had quite an easy time with their menopause and therefore think that we should all shut up 
Yeah, and look, I think this is this is something I talk about with people is if you're the one in five who have a breeze of it, then it's your responsibility to understand the experience of those who don't. Yeah. So that you can be an advocate and a compassionate supporter. It's the same as if you don't have the female biological stuff, no matter how you identify gender wise, is you will be related to, married yep. to, work with. Yep people who do have this as part of their experience and so it's like mental health in lots of ways although again that's like the cancer metaphor and that this is something that affects all people yeah is that just being aware understanding how to be a bit more flexible and supportive give people some space or whatever helps meet their needs for that time so that they can keep being the people they want to be and contributing in the way they want. Absolutely. Yeah, you and, know. and you know, because that's what Jeanette was saying, just have empathy, just have empathy. It all boils just down to, to that ultimately. Yeah. yeah. And with yeah. ageism, it does drive me crazy because it's like how many 21-year-olds do you or maybe 31-year-olds do you interview for a job thinking they'll be there for the next 10 years? Do you, like, do you, do you think about that with everybody? And so like women in their early 50s, it's like, you know, the official age of retirement is not till 65. So you're just imagining that they're going to be with you for the next 15 years? Well, you know, the average, even when back in the day when uh, I was in the recruitment game like 20 odd years ago, in the early 2000s, the average length of stay in a job for a New Zealander was two years and three months. Right. right. Wow. It's still about that. Yeah, right. Now there are people doing crazy job changes, leaving after five weeks, because the talent market's the way it is, people leaving after five weeks for $60,000 more and stuff like that. There's all mm. sorts of stuff happening, and that's it's a complex, as with any system, it's a complex system of market forces. But there's no getting away from the fact our population is ageing. Mm. Women make up a large proportion of our population and of our workforce. Mm-hmm. And as I said at the beginning, the, you know, menopausal women, 45 to 55, fastest growing workforce demographic in the world we're staying in work because we want to and Mm. because we need to yeah and beyond retirement age because we need to a lot of the time as well 100 percent. people are going to need to work for the money but they're also going to want to work and the ways in which we work will change it won't and but they're changing for everybody anyway in terms of flexible working four day weeks job sharing portfolio working all of these changes are happening for the whole workforce, mm-hmm. which is actually going to facilitate better outcomes for older workers and for organisations. And we need older, more experienced heads who've experienced more of the system change through time, have seen the highs and lows and the ups and downs, know how to navigate things like recessions, pandemics, etc. Because although younger people have energy and ideas and there's fluid intelligence which they bring to it, Crystallized intelligence, which is a thing in terms of the way the brain is different in midlife and beyond, brings wisdom, better meaning making, seeing patterns, building teams, creating connectivity and cultures. And so creating environments and opportunities that don't see people who are menopausal Mm -hmm. or in their 50s as past it. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of women, they don't see examples of women in the workplace in their 50s and 60s that they identify with and want to be like. Yeah, well, and they've been banished banished from every television show and yeah, things like well, that Yeah, God as well. help you if you decide to let your hair go grey, hey? Like Woman in Canada, did you see yes. that? Yes, yes, there was a, a news, for people that don't know, a newscaster decided to go grey and was sort of celebrating that and then promptly got fired by her network, but then has just been picked up by a rival network. And yeah, she's actually co- she's covering the, the death of the Queen, which I thought was kind of a magnificent sort of sidestep from there. Yeah, so you're great. So did you dye your hair for a while or did you just decide? Yeah, because I, I had dark hair and because I grew it out for a bit, but then I never liked the look of myself. <laughs> so, and because of the way I wear my hair up off my forehead, as I started to get more and more grey, you get this, I'm dying it quite dark, you get a hard waterline <laughs> right. <laughs> as, it's, as it's going up. And uh, so I kind of tried various shades of blonde and streaking and stuff like that, which never really worked because my skin's not, my body's not intended to have blonde hair. Right. Until I think I was in my 50th year and my, the guy who was coloring my hair, who's beautiful Japanese chap said, you know what, I think we should stop. I was like, but, 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 you know, wow. whoop, whoop, alert, alert, gray hair, old lady. And he said, I said, I, I can't, that would make me look old. He said, honestly, I have women half your age 
come in here and pay 600 bucks a time to walk out with hair that will not look as good as yours does. It's a, it's a thing now. Wow. And I was like, okay, it helps that they're 20 something and they have 20 something year old skin because yeah. of course they don't look old. <laughs> So he said, no, it's all, he said, you always have a really good cut. So you will not look like a frumpy middle-aged lady. I mean, what, what a great hairdresser. He's doing himself out of money and empowering you at the same time. Like, cause I talked to Peter Mathias and she's just made that decision. And I, I saw her on the, in a magazine and I was like, what, where's the red? I know. She said she's quite happy that her towels won't be <laughs> coloured because I've been dyeing my hair red since 1992, so that will be quite a big thing for me as well it's to a get big, to that point. It is a big thing. The yeah. University of Exeter in the UK did a study that was published last year looking at the trade-off between authenticity and competence that women, because this stopping dyeing your hair has, was something that was happening pre-pandemic, but the hashtag Silver Sisters movement has grown apace in the last two years as people have been locked down in their houses and not coloured their hair and they've gone, oh, bugger, I'll just grow it out. But this trade-off between competence and authenticity that women make in themselves and part of what they have to navigate in the workplace about being seen as an, exactly as uh, Lena, what's her face, has the Canadian broadcaster of the being old and therefore not being competent. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. It's, so, there's a social contract and some stereotype kind of norms that we have in society that really need to be addressed about how we perceive women in their 50s and things that are identified with them, like menopause, mm. gray hair, a changing body shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is, I've been dyeing my hair since I was, what was that? I was 20, 20. So, yeah. you know, it wasn't, it wasn't about looking younger. Then I just really like my red hair. So it's yeah. a amount of people that go, is it not natural because I've just had it for so long? So it is going to be an interesting, because, you know, Peter's production company is called Redhead Productions. So she was like, that was how much of a fundamental part of her it was. It started in the 50s with clearall and that sort of thing around about the same time that everyone was being told to take estrogen so that they would look younger and be more pleasant to be around oh I know so you wouldn't be a galloping catastrophe and shit like that so <laughs> I mean I probably took you for hours but now I have the question we have to talk about obviously is your LinkedIn group so now how did yeah. that happen and and things oh well this was part of my being pissed off in 2021 and I put up a post I think it was like August which was a bit of a what the fuck post in fact it had WTF question mark exclamation mark at the top of the graphic that went with it that basically was a little mini rant about menopause and menopause in the workplace and it my belief that it is dealing with this as the new edge of diversity equity inclusion well-being performance for women right you know like okay we've gone through this pregnancy return yes. to work working yes. mums thing etc this is the next thing that happens in terms of women's lives and therefore their work and so I reckon this is the new edge but we're not talking about it I didn't know about it what the hell who's up for a conversation so I put that up had like several hundred people say yes please and then thought oh well I'll start a group at which point my husband slash business partner was telling me about the part this menopause thing plays in our business strategy because you seem to be putting quite a lot of time into it I'm like I'm not sure yet um yeah. but, <laughs> but also give me some space dude but give me some right. space dude yeah and um but he's very supportive but and then, yeah, started the group. And so that it's been a year, coming up on a year. And yeah, like I'm most, I started this podcast in October. So, yeah. yeah, right. And if I look at the group right now, where are we sitting at? 981 members. Yeah, and it's a very chatty group. It's a really great group. I mean, mm. the intention with it is, so Sarah Connor, who's the founder of Menopause Over Martinis, has her Facebook group, which has several thousand members. And it's an awesome community that's very much about the personal experience of menopause and supporting people through symptoms and lifestyle and medical, you know, links to medical help, etc. The LinkedIn group is much more about menopause in the workplace and what we can do around awareness and education at work. So I talk about it being a place that's where the intention is about elevating, enriching and amplifying the conversation about menopause at work because we're very much in an awareness raising stage in yep. New Zealand and yep. in most of the world at the moment. I wanted it to be a, a sharing community and a community that wasn't about me, but actually about the idea and about the 
practice what were people doing. And what I've seen happen, particularly in the last few months, is it go from people just kind of like, what is menopause? And, and looking at information like that to actually beginning to do something. So there's more activity. This We've got World Menopause Day coming up on the 18th of October. That's the day I launched this podcast last yeah. year. So, yeah. mm-hmm. so much activity happening at the moment, so much planned. I know that Nikki and Sarah are both, um, Nikki Bazant and Sarah Connor are booked up with menopause talks through Great. September or October. Are you doing menopause talks? No, I'm not. I'm not, not at this point. I don't, I, I'm going to leave that to the experts. Right. I'd say you're an expert. The... <laughs> you seem like an expert to me, love. <laughs> I know. Well, I'm really, a bit further to that point, it's something I'm really passionate about. And I just, I want to be careful about where I put my energies because this is part of a broader conversation for me about leadership, well-being, personal growth and leadership capacity mm-hmm. rather than, say, Nikki or Sarah who are really, menopause. really keen and specific around menopause. And so right. they're the experts. I'd rather they did the, they can go out and do the awareness raising talks. I kind of, there's a level above this that I want to pull up and say menopause is part of a conversation about midlife and what I see is a new power band of female leadership right. in our 50s and beyond yeah. and, you know, a second life where we have, you know, the potential for the most profound leadership impact of our lives. Don't let menopause get in the way. I feel, sort of look at menopause as being a gateway experience yeah into the best decades of our lives, to be honest. Great. Okay. Was your doctor good when you went to, to, to them? Oh, my doctor, I've had the same doctor since I moved, you know, back to New Zealand about 25 years ago, and she's good, um, but this wasn't... In her wheelhouse? No. And so oh. what I decided to do, rather than... So like I said, this is part of the 2021 thing. What happened, actually, it was reading Nikki, Nikki B's book, I read right. Nikki, Nikki P, Nikki Pellegrino's book first. Great book. Don't sweat it. How to Make the Change a Good One. Uh, <laughs> great, great book. Everyone should read both of them. I read that and that made me think, oh, maybe the SHRT things, hmm, maybe I should look a bit more closely at this. Yeah. And then I went and did a whole lot of research around the WHI yep. stuff because yep. just science, science board. And then yep. read Nikki Bazant's book which is a really great guide book. Yeah, it's quite the manual, that one. It's a manual. I think Nikki Pellegrino's book is a great place to start and then read Nikki B's book, Nikki Bazant's book, because it is a manual. It's the sort of thing you'll have as a reference book and you'll go back and look at it yeah. time and time again. Yeah. And through that, I went, okay, actually maybe it would help. And so I went to the Australasian Menopause Society website and looked up some people in Auckland. I thought, I don't need a foreign endocrinologist. I don't need an obstetrician OBGYN because mm-hmm. I've had my time with them right. in the past. And mm-hmm. based on what I've seen, they don't all get menopause education no. anyway. No, they don't. And so I found a lovely doctor called Dr. Sue Laughlin, who works out of the Dodson Medical Center over in Milford, who's a general practitioner who's got a specialist postgrad qualifications in obstetrics and gynecology, but she is a GP. And she runs a menopause clinic. And so I was like, she sounds like a bit of me. And so I went and saw her and she's been marvellous. Very, very matter of fact, which is what you want. Yeah. It helped that I knew a bunch going in and I said, these are my symptoms. This is what's going on. And this is what I'd like, please. <laughs> exactly. That's why I'm like, Anna Sophia was like, get your shopping list together and go and see the doctor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and she said, look, you know, you've still got a uterus, so you need to have progesterone and that'll help with these things because anxiety was a big anxiety and sleep. Yeah. Insomnia were big things for me. And she said the progesterone will help with both of those things. And that for that alone, it's been amazing. And then the estrogen in terms of the transdermal patches, she said it comes in five kind of dose levels. But she said 25 is kind of like the nano dose, and I think you will start you on 50 and see how you go. Do a three-month trial on that. Dependent on how the relief you get, we can try something higher, but let's start there because we want to give you the minimum viable dose of estrogen because, you know, est- over There are some est- risks. There, there are, are definitely risks. some risks, right? Yeah. And again, remember, it's about easing the glide plane, mm. not not going through it at all. Yeah, right, okay. And that's the thing. Mm. So I have... Um, I, and look, honestly, I think I was 12 days in and I was like, holy shit, should have done this. 
Wow. A long time ago. Right, okay. So was the joint pain, partic- did that go away? Did everything just improve? Oh, look, some, it's, it's helped with a lot of things and then other things are just, they're kind of in process now. Like right. once you start developing arthritis. Yeah. But it has definitely helped with the, the vasomotor stuff. So everything to do with the way our bodies regulate temperature effectively yeah yep. things like the migraine I had the other day when we'd first scheduled to do that I haven't had one of those for like five six months so that was the right. first one of those I'd had for ages right but it's yeah I you notice it, it like most medications you know oh I'm feeling fine I should stop taking it the minute you stop doing it I was like four days in I went away and didn't take quite enough of the stuff with me and had four days without it before I got home. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> wow, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really fucking working. Great. So what do you yeah. what do you see the trajectory of you taking it there for? Because that's that next thing is when do you come off it? Yeah, well, it was interesting. I was speaking to a wonderful woman who's a GP who's in – she's 70, and this was at a gig I was speaking at for, for on a different topic. And – we got talking about this, her partner introduced us and said, and, you know, oh, Kate's got this thing on menopause. And so the woman who was the doctor, we started talking about this. She's 70 and she's still taking it. And she's her view is, I'm not coming off it. I see my endocrinologist every six months to make sure that everything's kosher, but mm-hmm. I'm never, as far as I'm concerned, I'm never coming off it. There are actually many more long-term health benefits for women Mm. provided you can take it safely and not everybody can for a variety of reasons Mm -hmm. always get medical advice folks on this because I'm because my epilepsy pills can potentially interact so that's you've got to be careful yeah there are definitely some contraindications in some people who just can't take it they find their bodies can't tolerate it but yeah, Jennifer Ward Leland hated it. So did Pinky Agnew. So it's been really interesting. Whereas Peter Matthias is like, you'll take it from my cold dead hands. So it is, you know. I am with Peter Matthias <laughs> on that one. Right. Yep. Okay. Right. Well, we'll we'll check back in and see how it's going at later stages. But we've been yammering on for an hour and a quarter. But uh, so my last couple of questions is: Is there anything else that you wanted to talk to around menopause? You wanted to highlight to people? We've covered quite a lot. I I think it's just don't be afraid of it. Educate yourself whether you're someone who might experience it, is experiencing it, or you know women. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> you know a woman, yes. Women. I know, you, if you know women, because this is just part of our life experience, it's part mm-hmm. of our trajectory. It's not to be feared. It can be. I, I think, you know, I think it's an experience through which we can learn about ourselves and we can become much more aware of our bodies, our relationships with our bodies. Mm-hmm. And with aging, you know, it's an invitation to think differently about how we do life and how we work. I used to be a throw all the hours at it, work six days a week, and now I look at it and go, I just can't do that. And I don't want to. And you yeah. know what? I can reorganize things so I can have a live a better life and a healthier one Mm. and still have impact. So I think don't be afraid of it, learn about it, you know, be curious. And uh, the invitation I think is to look at it as an opportunity for, for growth. Yeah. Right. Great. So fun fact out of the box, fun fact section. Do you have a fun fact for us out of your box? I, as it were? I do. Despite the fact that the conversation about menopause and often actually about women's hormones and stuff is often about estrogen or, and at the very least progesterone might get thrown in. The fun fact is that women actually have um, more testosterone in their bodies than we do estrogen uh-huh. on an absolute unit for unit basis. So mm-hmm. less than men But testosterone, that's something that most women don't understand, the importance of the role of testosterone in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, although the conversation is crazy hormones of chicks and estrogen and stuff, estrogen is responsible for a lot as a messenger in our body. Yes. But, yeah, the the fun fact is there's way more testosterone in your body than there is estrogen. So I'm all for embracing all of the strength and attitude and everything that comes with testosterone. And right. I think women could do more. Are you supplementing it? That. Not at this point, but. You're pondering. I'm po- later. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Uh, okay, well, I think we've talked far, far too long enough and you've got. <laughs> 
Have we could have yabber about this forever, but you know, I say congratulations. Your group is so engaged. I mean, it's probably a bit of work running that. So thank you for taking on that admin role for all of us. And I'm talking to Sarah on Wednesday, in fact. So I'm Yay. doing the, the social media mavens this week. So yeah, anyway, and um keep up the fantastic work and your hair looks marvelous. Thanks very much, Penny. Same That's to you. Right. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. So that was the forthright and fabulous Kate Billing, who could not be contained into an hour of chat, no matter how hard I edited. So you could say, nous sommes trop, we are too much and too fucking right, mate. Do check out her LinkedIn group for heaps of articles and chatter about menopause in the workplace, and I'll pop some info into the show notes. An amazing menopause news this week, Eutrogestin, which is micronized progesterone will be funded for anyone in menopause. Pharmac has made the decision. And if you don't know, if you're taking estrogen patches, etc., you have to take progesterone if you have a womb because it protects against endometrial cancer. And I talked to one woman who hadn't known that was why she was prescribed the progesterone and she wasn't taking it because it was expensive. And I was like, oh, no, you have to take it to protect your womb. So this is so great. And it helps, you know, level the playing field for equity around menopause. But Thanks, as always, for listening. I've had a busy week this week, appearing in four shows and seeing five, which is kind of bonkers. But I am still mainly wearing a mask in the theatre, and if you are heading to a show, ponder that, because remember, the people on stage cannot, and we all need to protect our livelihoods. It's certainly starting to feel a little like the before times with COVID, though obviously we are not out of these spiky protein woods just yet. Stay tuned for next week when we chat to Sarah Connor from Menopause Over Martinis, also from Fighting Off Terminators. No, not the same one, but she fights off stigma and shame around menopause. Kakite Shoei Ovarians, Penny Ashton signing out. Have a wonderful week.